Francisco Marroquín was Guatemala's first bishop and an early scholar in the Quiche Mayan language. The university named after him in Guatemala's capital has numerous resources on Maya culture from ancient times to the present day. Here at the campus, I walk along replicas of classic period Maya monuments called stelae, most commemorating royal events with political and religious overtones. Hello! This episode in the Native American Writing Systems playlist picks up from the last, which outlined the principles of Mayan glyphs in the ancient Cholan language they preserved. By following those principles, the current episode will examine the glyphs in a plate on display at one of the university's museums. If you haven't seen the previous episode yet, we will glance its basic ideas, but I welcome you to watch it for a more complete look into the subject. The main reason for my visit to the Universidad Francisco Marroquín was its Museo Popol Vuh, named after the epic myth of the Quiche Maya. The museum showcases an important collection of artifacts from Guatemala's history, from Maya civilization to the colonial period. One of my favorite works on display is this fine ceramic plate. It comes from the lowlands of Guatemala, and it dates to the late Classic period, namely from 600 to 900 AD. Comprised of 12 glyphs, this text encircles the plate's inner edge. Glyphs on a Maya ceramic often indicate who painted them, the type of vessel they are on, and sometimes even what it carried. This plate will give us two out of three, so let's find out which. You may use the syllable chart I presented in the previous episode or the one linked in the description box. Where should we start reading from? The text itself tells us. The first glyph represents the word alai, here, which often appears as the first glyph in circular texts. Its early appearance in such texts relates it to the concept of the primary standard sequence, which archaeologists and epigraphers have identified as a set of glyphs Maya scribes frequently used to begin an inscription. Also notice the preceding a glyph, attached to the main glyph to clarify that a lai begins with a. This a glyph adds no pronunciation to the main glyph, but rather specifies it, an example of a phonetic complement from the last episode. Also from the previous episode, you may remember that at least 85% of all glyphs can now be read. This one belongs in the other 15, so we'll have to pass it for now. This glyph combines the syllable signs for yi and qi. Classic Mayan words began and ended only with consonants, so we dropped the last vowel from the reading to find ch as the final consonant. Yi is a word related to ideas of presence, as upon the surface. This instance of the U glyph is expanded from the basic form. What typically appears is just the top part, which here shows the upper jaw for a whole face. As mentioned in the last video, variants of the U prefix commonly mark third-person possession in the Mayan languages. His, her, its. No gender marking. What is being owned? In the next glyphs. Glyphs for Tsi and Ba combine into Tsib, the root for to write. Words for writing and painting are either identical or related in the Mayan languages. The Li glyph is attached to the previous glyphs to complete the Al suffix, which indicates abstraction. For the case of writing, the Al suffix connotes drawing or decoration, according to Harry Kettinen and Christoph Helbke. Here we have a case of the Rebus principle. A woman's face in profile reads Na, a term for woman, here being used to represent the syllable formed by the consonant vowel pair. Together, these four glyphs read Utsibal Nach, a phrase that scholars have found on other texts to literally mean its drawings on the surface. Another instance of the U prefix for third person possession, then a sign for the La syllable. Fish is Kai in classic Mayan, and this design is a form of Ka, also a rebus principle. Again, we drop the last vowel. These glyphs form the word Ulak, his or her plate. This glyph is logographic, standing for a single morpheme unit of meaning, in this case, chak, meaning big or great. Because it looks so much like a skull, it had been formerly read as hol for skull or head. Cho, using a glyph in the shape of a mouse head, uses a glottalized consonant pronounced with a tense release. Ko closes the word, chok or youth. A glyph composed from ya, pi, and na. 
As an aside, an interesting rule suggested about Mayan glyphs is that when the vowel of a glyph differs from the preceding, the one that is actually pronounced is lengthened. So because the second to last glyph in this compound has E and B, and the final vowel is A in Na, which will be dropped anyway, the E from the final syllable is long, Yapin. The rule doesn't always hold, but it does happen with some frequency. Now we will read the full text. Alai unknown. Yich utzich bal nach ulak chak chok yapin. Here is presented the written surface of the plate of chak chok yapin. As I mentioned earlier in this video, writing on Maya ceramics often enlists at least two out of three features. One, who made the writing. Two, what type of vessel it's written on. And three, what the vessel contained. Do we have at least two of these three in the text? You may pause here to review the translation. Chak Chok Yapin, the owner of the work, may have been the scribe who composed it, so that would be the first of the three features. We also see the word Ulak, U meaning his or her, Lak meaning plate. So we know what type of vessel the Maya called this. In the center is a badly eroded painting of a face in profile with flowing locks of hair. The youthful, vigorous man was a frequent model for the maze god. If the glyphs themselves didn't say it, this plate could have perhaps once held a pile of corn. Knowing the morphemes and sounds of classic Mayan grammar and how the glyphs creatively combine them, you can potentially translate most of the glyphs in any ancient Maya text. This classic period plate from Guatemala shows how to use the guidelines presented here to read such works. Thank you and congratulations for participating in the translation along the way. Our next episode in the Native American Writing Systems playlist will take us south to Peru to explore messages encoded in patterns of paint and yarn. Join us for the following installment.